All right, fantastic. You wanna thanks, Matt. Happy to follow in your footsteps as well. Matt and I went to grad school together and he's probably got some stories on me. So the pace of my talk, I've got a cup of coffee to my left and it's gonna be on point as I've got about 35 minutes before I've got a hard cut out and head off to another webinar. But appreciate the opportunity to come in and contribute today. So we're gonna fly through some things and Liz has done a nice job of uh, converting the, the file and the slide deck into a PDF so that you can access some of the content that I'm gonna move through pretty quickly today. I work primarily for Rock River Laboratory, but have an adjunct uh, professor appointment as well. But in, in my Rock River Laboratory role, uh, the, the team is fun to work with. And I've learned a lot working with uh, nutritionist dairies from east to west coast uh, that you can see uh, dictated by the, by the dots here. So I'm going to lean on some of that expertise, particularly uh, those, learning from those out the west, a colleague of mine, Tony Timmons, for example, uh, who's taught me a little bit through experience about feeding low forage diets uh, beyond my own experience as a nutritionist coming out of grad school. I also have some experience in South America and Europe. So uh, alternative forages, uh, they may seem alternative to us in the Midwest, but cows can eat all sorts of different things. There are no forage requirements, which we'll come back to. The last two years have been a, a treat, right? So hopefully you can all stand up and maybe stretch out a little bit. I would encourage you to be active, uh, try and keep your, yourself moving through these tough times. Uh, uh, prior to the global pandemic, I mean, we, we've had challenging weather, depressed dairy economy, market swings, Repeated winter kill, delayed planting and harvest, one for a couple of years now back and forth. So we've got experience now with many new alternatives and uh, it forages and feeds and different way to feed cows. You've got some great resources in Matt uh, and Yuana and, and the uh, extension team to, to consider some of these options. Uh, in some cases, we're running out of forage inventories. One of my aims is, uh, in advising people is to try to get to a consistent point, whatever that looks like, not be swinging uh, from a high forage diet or wanting to maintain a high forage diet, but swinging back and forth between corn silage and alfalfa and hay and alternative forages, uh, maybe drop forage back just to a point where we can be consistent and carry out forages. Now we've got this uh, global pandemic. I, I hope you are all well and safe. Unfortunately, we've got some wild market swings beyond just financial. And I do want to comment, you may be feeling, or some of those you, you work and interact with may be feeling back to a corner from a stress standpoint. And it's very real. Uh, I will echo some of John Schitzky's work uh, and others. Uh, one of a strong motivating factor for me is uh, having walked and, and continuing to walk in my dad's footsteps. We lost him unexpectedly two and a half years ago. So our family dealt with immediate uh, tragedy, tragedy uh, in the blink of an eye. Uh, he was since a, an organ donor and provided life to over four others. So if you haven't, a little bit of activism, uh, my, my comment here, if you haven't checked that box on your, your driver's license, please uh, consider doing so. But uh, having dealt with that, uh, I, I have a new understanding and appreciation of stress and the physical effects on, on our mind and, and body. So in the moment, as we're all dealing with the pandemic, and uh, life is very different for us all and, and even more so for producers as, as the normal new normal for them is even different yet, which I'll speak a bit more to. Please make an effort to reach out to those around you, uh, talk, share with one another. Uh, sharing our feelings is not taboo. Uh, it's very important. I've made an effort to reach out to a few of my dairy colleagues and, and it, we're in pretty tough times. Uh, for example, we're, we're needing to, to dump milk. Uh, speaking with a group earlier today from California to New York, we are dumping milk east to west coast. Uh, Matt Akins and I and Liz will be authoring. Uh, Matt and Liz primarily have, have done a good job uh, sourcing some resources to consider what, what should happen when we have to dump milk and we potentially feed some back. So look for some of that coming from their camp later today. But we're needing to, to do just never before uh, seen or recognized or forecast things. You see my family here, uh, my wife Katie and, and kids Sam and Lucy, they're also motivating factors, but I do have a dairy background as well, which helps me recognize where the rubber hits the road. So uh, we've got a lot of uh, uh, several new normals that we're working through an economic no uh, normal that, that is vastly different today than it was a month ago and a month ago different than it was three years ago. We've got a new environmental normal, which I'll speak to a bit. Uh, animal nutrition, uh, there really is no normal. We can do a lot of different things, but I'll try and highlight. Uh, epidemiology, we've got a new normal there. Uh, and then politically, I mean, that, who knows what normal is there. We're not going to, we're not going to get into these areas today, but we'll try and focus on the top few. I put this graphic up and if you've listened to a webinar from me, uh, with me or, or been at a meeting in the past, I'll often reference Mark Linsmeyer's work uh, with Margin Smart. I pay to get this newsletter. Reach out to Mark if you'd like to get it on a week-to-week -week basis, but break even forecast uh, for margin per hundred weight of milk for an average dairy in the upper Midwest the next 12 months is right here if you follow my cursor and I'll, I'll maybe get my pointer here. So this is break even for 100 weight. Uh, if we would have looked at this graphic, uh, say a month ago, we would have been forecast somewhere between a dollar to $2 margin over the next six to 12 months for 100 weight of milk. We were looking at some economic relief on top of what we've seen the last quarter or two. Unfortunately, as of uh, two weeks ago, 
we saw margins erode to essentially break even. And uh, unfortunately, even further yet, uh, we, we've tumbled another $2 margin per hundred weight. So we are in unprecedented uh, economically challenging times for our dairies beyond just uh, needing to deal with the pandemic, shelter in place, uh, perhaps uh, labor issues, uh, people not wanting to work, things along those lines. Our dairies are uh, looking at some pretty tough economic conditions for the next three to, to 12 months. So hence my comments on stress earlier. I, I do hope that uh, part of our federal stimulus package will address this. But I mean, the bottom line is we need to just figure out how to sustain right now, uh, perhaps at $15 or less per hundred weight of milk. So we're going to be doing some things very differently on farm, but you've got some great resources, uh, myself included, hopefully to work through this. As we look at uh, economic performance, uh, let's also move and, and Mark and the team asked me to speak a little bit about uh, thinking about components, milk components, fat and protein. I would suggest we look at energy corrected milk per cow per day and also incorporate dry matter intake uh, into our performance evaluations when looking at peer groups. Uh, case in point, we have two herds here, two and seven, that would be classically defined as high performing, even on energy corrected milk basis. But we've got vastly different uh, dry matter intakes and then business uh, efficiency and performance. One dairy is able to produce 100 weight of milk for $5.40, whereas the other in feed costs, the other, the other dairies. Uh, unfortunately, doing it at seven dollars. So, uh, working as either a support agent with teams uh, with dairies, or or consider adding these KPI into your uh, evaluation with, within your peer group, because there are big opportunities out there in margin and efficiency. Uh, some of what we'll talk about today can fold back into that, but let's make sure we are thinking about some terms that would relate to business performance more so than just performance per cow per day. Let's get into talking about our, our environmental normal now, and we are in to uh, forage shortages because we've had anything but normal the last few growing years. This is a, an image adapted from NOAA looking at, I think, 15, maybe 30 years of average rainfall. So this is one of the great things of, about dairying in the upper Midwest is that we get on average about 30 inches of rainfall, which is enough, enough to support some pretty decent yielding crops where we don't have to pay for it like our colleagues out west. Uh, where they're paying per inch of water. But if we look at the last two years, now we're looking at a percentage of normal rainfall relative to the past 30 years. Uh, the light green to dark green to light blue to dark blue represents anywhere between 110 and 200 percent rainfall. So uh, lots of greens and blue here. If we look at and focus in on the upper Midwest, looking at Wisconsin, here's that, that dark green and blue suggesting that we're, we've been 125 to 150 percent of rainfall last year, which we recognize that was a little bit closer to us uh, in, in time. But as we look back at 2018, we see greens and blues. And if we look at 2017, look at this, we see more grain. So our environment, our growing conditions the last few years have been substantially wetter. So uh, beyond just thinking about emergency forages, perhaps we should be thinking about alternative forages and different ways of farming. Uh, if for whatever reason, this, this is our new normal. Uh, as I say that, perhaps we'll, we'll run into a drought this year. I certainly hope not, crossing my fingers, knock on wood. Uh, but it, it certainly appears like we need to consider uh, managing forages with wetter, wetter weather, maybe 40 to 60 inches of rainfall instead of 30 on average. Uh, this is, a, and, and also know that it's not just us in the Midwest. This is an image uh, from the Eastern US, unfortunately a, a producer that was forced for, for chopping through uh, some flooding conditions. And this wasn't even 2019, this was 2018. So we are not just in it alone here in the upper Midwest. This stems from South Dakota through Vermont and New York. And I think that's lost on some people at times, but we are in this together through the dairy forage growing uh, regions of the country, heavy ones. As we look at forage quality now and transition, uh, we, I want to point out that milk 2006, and as we seek to understand value per pound or value per ton of feed are, are kind of dead metrics. I, I think there are going to be some positive things coming from Matt and the university team in the future uh, coming up with a better index to evaluate feeds, but I'll just throw this out there somewhat comically. When we look at uh, how to evaluate forage, uh, Matt was speaking earlier about sorghum and fiber and digestible fiber, and he's right on point. When we look at where the energy comes from in feed and then what we want to aim for, we want to look at, and this is a breakdown of where the total digestible nutrients come from in corn silage. Uh, so the combination of fiber content and digestibility, which is detailed here in the orange section, and then the combination of starch coupled with starch digestibility, and starch and grain is pretty darn digestible. Uh, we can see that about 75% of this circle is made up of, of by total digestible fiber and total digestible starch. So bottom line is when we look at today's forage analyses, and we want to understand what opportunities do we have to improve efficiency, feed efficiency, and performance, perhaps with alternative forages or lower forage diets. Uh, we have substantial opportunity to, to improve 
digestible nutrient load. And this might be getting uh, a little bit into the weeds from a nutrition standpoint, but every pound of digestible fiber or starch, understanding that 75% of the value in corn salad or our alternative forages are going to be coming from fiber and starch uh, if, for the most part. Every pound we can unlock of total digestible nutrient is going to be about uh, worth three and a half pounds of milk. So the, the goal should be higher quality forages, higher total digestible nutrient load, but also coupled with and against uh, yield and dry matter yield so that we're looking at uh, how can we optimally pr produce uh, opt uh, the cheapest ton of digestible dry matter per acre. As I look at today's forage analyses with uh, Milk 2006 kind of being by the wayside, uh, fiber and starch content are right up there looking at TTNDFD, uh, learning from Professor Combs is, is one metric I'm, I'm using to understand fiber digestibility and then looking to have some assessment of starch digestibility, uh, primarily for corn silages and grains. But if we're looking at alternative forages, the top four are gonna, really going to be the ones we're going to want to look at. Ash content is something that's going to come in and contaminate and, and uh, rob our feed of value, diluting out energy, potentially bringing in some anti-nutritional factors. But uh, work with your nutritionist and look at fiber and starch and fiber digestibility on your reports to interpret uh, what the value might be. Uh, fiber digestibility is increasingly important. I'm going to show you uh, just a, a report from a, a survey that uh, was done in eastern Wisconsin by Jared Geyser and uh, some team uh, with, with CP Feeds and, and Land Lakes had uh, contributed this uh, Perino to this as well. But we had 60 herds in eastern Wisconsin in 2018 uh, where we sampled the corn silages and we looked at uh, just corn silage quality relative to milk production uh, for the herd or reported for the herd. And what we observed were some positive relationships between uh, fiber digestibility uh, and negative relationships with UNDF. So your nutritionist will probably uh, be able to help you unlock and uncode this a little bit more. But uh, for every unit of improved fiber digestibility with corn silage, and I would argue for forage as a whole, we could expect perhaps uh, anywhere between eight tenths and a pound of milk response uh, when we looked at the variety across these herds. And, and this is right in line with what Mike Allen and Masahita Oba published in 1999, in fact, even to a greater extent. So uh, these top numbers here were suggesting that every unit of fiber digestibility would increase dry matter intake by about four tenths and then would increase milk production by about 0.6 pounds. Uh, so by, by default, this would be an improved uh, improvement in feed conversion efficiency because we would be gaining more milk than we were uh, gaining in intake. Well, if we look at this 2018 data and hypothesize, or maybe I can speculate that uh, today's cows may respond to an even greater extent to forage quality. So when we're looking at, looking at alternative forages, when we're considering uh, different varieties, depending upon the animals we're feeding, fiber digestibility is paramount for lactating dairy cattle, uh, transition cows in, into uh, early lactation and peak lactation. So uh, we, we wanna make sure that we've got a, a valuable measurement of an assessment of fiber digestibility uh, in, in our grading scheme. Uh, here's graphing out then the same data, but looking at uh, fiber digestibility across those 60 dairies in Eastern Wisconsin against feed efficiency for the herd. So taking uh, energy corrected milk divided by dry matter intake. If you don't know this number or your clients don't know this number, they should. Uh, we see ranges out there from 1.3 pounds of milk per pound of energy uh, of dry matter intake, upwards of 1.7 to 1.8 pounds of energy corrected milk uh, divided by dry matter intake. This is going to much more tightly relate to feed, uh, not feed conversion efficiency, but profitability uh, per hundred weight of milk or margin potential. Uh, so I think it was Jared perhaps that um, uh, might have mentioned before that that margins are, are tough while well, they're, they're they're slim to non-existent to deeply negative right now so we need to unlock every bit we can uh, from every pound of intake as we look at below average forage quality of 50 percent versus above average forage quality of 60 percent ndfd 30 perhaps for corn silage that in itself would would help potentially unlock maybe 25 to 30 cents in margin potential per hundred weight of milk we're shipping the same hundred weight of milk but uh, with higher quality corn silage, we're going to have less in feed costs just because those cows are going to eat less and produce the same. When I recapped uh, 2019 silage potential, just reflecting back upon last year before transitioning and talking uh, more exclusively about alternative forages, uh, I, this was a slide from the Southwest Nutrition Conference, uh, one of the last conferences I spoke at before we went on a little bit further restriction and, and shelter and safe at home. But when I compared and contrast 18 and 19 forages, uh, for the Midwest in the upper right hand corner and the Eastern US and the Western US, I mean, similar milk production potential, at least on paper. 
so if you've got some challenges feeding 2019 corn silage, uh, there may be some other things going on, uh, but I'd welcome helping out and support uh, of, of your nutritionists and your efforts there to, to consider what those might be. But it's not as though we had catastrophic uh, forage quality per the lab analyses. Building upon uh, Joanna and, and Matt's conversation before, some alternative forages that uh, you may have uh, more recently gotten experience with, or, or I have as well, uh, using corn as a, a cover crop. Uh, for example, last year where we got past, uh, say, our, our window where we could have corn yield out to what would be traditionally silage, but we, we just put it in the ground as a cover crop, got some experience there. Uh, a number of cool season grasses, uh, Italian ryegrass that Ioana spoke about before, uh, and then some other blends as well. Oats and, and peas and peas and oats uh, can make decent forage, a little bit lesser quality. Matt did a good job hitting on some of the warmer season grasses. Uh, so those are valuable alternatives. To, uh, you wanna hit on teff grass. And then there are these blends of, of warm and cool season grasses and clover blends, blends, cocktails. In general, what I'll comment, of course, I work for a laboratory, so take what I tell you with a grain of salt, but uh, lab analyses are going to be okay. Dairyland, Rock River Laboratory do a good job uh, building up their calibration databases. So if you've got some of these alternative feeds, uh, even off-spec peas, uh, perhaps that didn't meet, meet uh, canning or soybeans, uh, other vegetables, We've got great experience analyzing these and built into our routine forage analyses. So the reports you get back from the laboratory are gonna be pretty good. Here's a slide that I'm not gonna spend any time really working through in detail, but this is some content that will be part of an upcoming hordes article uh, I wrote discussing alternative forages and opportunities. Uh, the slides I've got in slide deck are shared via PDF thanks to Liz's efforts. So please come back to this, provide this to your nutritionist and you could run some diet examples with these if you'd like. What I did in these, and I'll just jump out of uh, my presentation mode, but I went to rockoverlab.com, uh, click the member login, and then uh, you can get free user credentials from the laboratory and you can log in and use the statistics, statistics option here and you can search against Rock River's entire database. So, uh, I mean, this is a value added, a kind of an extension effort here. There are no strings attached. There's no cost associated with this, but this is how I generated the means. I searched for all samples submitted to the laboratory in the upper Midwest for a certain period of time, labeled peas, soybeans, rye, cocktails. So if you wanted to run some what-if scenarios and you didn't have feed analyses uh, to look at or you didn't have research handy to look at, you could go out to the lab database and, and do a, a search. I believe Dairyland Laboratory has something uh, similar where you can pull out nutrition parameters to run your own partial budgets. So as I did that and exclusively looked at, uh, say, an average alfalfa, which I've got, uh, we have a lot of experience with versus uh, some of these grass and cocktail blends, uh, just using Rock River data. Alfalfa will tend to be a little bit greater in protein content versus uh, a grass blend. And, and then that protein uh, dilutes out some of the, the fiber. So we have a little bit higher fiber content and fiber by nature is a little bit less digestible than protein. So theoretically, we would have less energy per pound pound or per ton uh, in any of uh, these grass cocktail blends. However, as Matt spoke to before, grasses can bring in, and uh, Joanna did as well, exceptional fiber digestibility. So as we looked at this total track NDF digestibility metric, which, take, which takes into account UNDF and digestion rate, and gives us a pretty good cow level fiber digestibility measurement, building them you know, maybe a little bit more accurate than an NDF D30 or 48, but there were 10 to maybe 12 units increase in TT NDF D here. So uh, when I plug these in and model diet, similar to how my colleague Matt would with a, say an NRC type approach, uh, this is a little bit busy down here, but I had a diet built upon alfalfa with nine pounds of dry matter and a, and a diet built with a, a cocktail blend, the average from the database that I found uh, with nine pounds of dry matter. So on an as fed basis, this would be somewhere in the maybe 18 to 25 pounds of, of as fed feed. There was a pretty close, uh, pretty close to, to even milk production. A little bit less milk per cow with the cocktail blend, but here's where it would be important to then sort out what's the cost of production per acre and what kind of yield did we get uh, so that we can understand if this was a positive return on investment or not. But uh, it's not as though we have sizable differences in milk production with average forages uh, coming out of the database. I wanna put a huge plug in for, for Matt, and uh, I sent him a text earlier today. I wasn't certain if he was gonna, gonna cover this approach, but uh, there's a, there's a I think a PDF that would have been attached to the invite you would have all seen. Take a look at this comparing, comparing field or forage quality uh, and look at how uh, Greg and Matt uh, using some field data from Dan Ferst's farm. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, Dan. 
uh, well, how they worked through and evaluated uh, the, the return on investment and the economics uh, coming out of uh, Dan's field. What they did was uh, looked at forage quality, looked at yield, and then calculated total dry, digestible dry matter. Matt, I hope I'm paraphrasing this correctly. And the right way to evaluate alternative forages is to de determine and derive dollar per ton of digestible dry matter. And they did a nice job. Here were a couple of the tables that were produced as uh, Matt and their team looked at winter rye, corn silage, and then some of these other, uh, other forages, cocktail and alfalfa. Uh, they first calculated pounds of milk per acre, uh, pounds of total digestible material, I believe. And then uh, ran through cost of production per acre with this worksheet so that they were able to determine and derive dollars per ton of digestible dry matter. And this is how we should be evaluating these alternative forages. This is exactly what I've been looking for people to, to do when, they're, when they call up asking about, hey, does this work or does that work or does this work? Let's figure what these numbers out on your farm and then let's make, make decisions based upon that. So coming out of, uh, this is just one case study. So uh, be careful with this information. The environment's gonna have a huge impact, growing environment and soil on both yield and quality. But as we look at uh, the costs per unit of digestible dry matter, again, Matt, if I'm way off base here, please reel me back in. But it looks like we were pretty close between this cocktail blend and, uh, and alfalfa. So, John? Yeah, Matt? Yeah, that was tons per tons of dry matter. Okay, so that's just right. total tons of dry that's matter. Total here. dry matter. So then we could we could also bring in and fold in uh, total digestible nutrients or digestibility. Uh, so if this is the total tons of dry matter, uh, 110 versus 108. If I would look at this, then um, we could just compare and contrast the the milk per pound of total digestible dry matter, and and the cocktail was 3,000, alfalfa was 2,900. So a slight bump in TDN, uh, total digestible nutrient, would, would contribute to that. So despite the fact that we maybe would have a, a little bit less yield, a little bit greater cost in total digestible, or I'm sorry, total dry matter, the digestibility of this dry matter would be uh, a little bit better than alfalfa. So these are probably pretty darn equivalent. So hopefully I haven't lost you in working through this, but that, that's the, the way that we should, should be looking at this, in my opinion. Matt may reach out and slap me later, but we'll look forward to that. Uh, other options out there, if we come back and decide to seed back in alfalfa, another hot topic has been reduced or low lignin alfalfa. So it's not an alternative forage, uh, but I'll put this in anyways, just so you can have these numbers to potentially work from. Uh, if we have a 10% reduction in lignin or an eight or a 20% reduction in lignin, uh, these are numbers I've pulled from Professor Dan Undersander based on his experience, uh, that the associated lignin Rate, uh, levels in the forage and then your nutritionist will probably use uh, some of these parameters to formulate diets uh, just pass these along to your nutritionist to use in, in any sort of uh, formulations that might be looking at alfalfa alternatives and then looking at uh, cost of balance against that just now speaking about uh, moving away a little bit from from alternative forages but just low forage diet recommendations Cows do not have forage requirements. So I, I know it's a, a very different maybe experience for us if we're running out of forage and, and trying to maintain say a 50 to 55% forage in diets or maybe your nutritionist will be using forage NDF uh, and we want, want to stay above some threshold here. So these are uh, guidelines on the right hand side from the 2001 NRC. But cows have nutrient requirements. So uh, learning from my colleague out, out west and, and uh, running some low forage diets myself in the past, we can get down to as low as 25 to 30 percent forage and cows aren't going to tip over dead uh, we're not going to have acidosis we'll have to monitor our feed efficiency but cows can be healthy and productive at very very low forage diets that's because cows have nutrient requirements not forage requirements and so in situations like this we might bump up the total amount of fiber in the diet using uh, highly digestible fibrous byproducts such as soy hulls corn gluten feed uh, distillers grains if you can find it perhaps some other digestible fiber, but we just rebalance and change where our nutrients are coming from. We do wanna drop starch down in these diets just because there may not be as much effective fiber. So I would suggest increasing sugar levels in these diets uh, by way of maybe a few different means, uh, whey permeate perhaps, maybe a, a molasses type, type of ingredient or if, if it's coming in by way of some of our co-products. But if we're dropping down to 35 to 40% forage, we're gonna to wanna to get to 20% starch or less in the diet. So we can probably move away from looking at forage NDF and start to look at just total NDF, uh, starch and sugar, and then monitor cud chewing. UNDF is a new parameter 
uh, as well that we're starting to use. So there, there's probably maybe a threshold on farm. Each farm is going to be different, but probably a threshold on farm where, where we may uh, trend into acidosis land if we just don't have enough uh, physical fiber to stimulate rumen. Uh, but this is going to be determined on a farm by farm basis. So work with the nutritionist there. And I would say in general, when we start to bring in anything greater than three pounds, again, I work for a laboratory, so maybe take it, take it with a grain of salt, but I, I carry an adjunct appointment as well. And, and um, I mean this sincerely, if there's more than three pounds of something in a diet or more than five to 10% of the, the total diet intake, I, I would suggest we should have some idea of what the nutritional value is and, and what it can contribute. There are some pretty substantial swings that we've recognized in the last three months and, and three years uh, in nutritive supply based on commodity feeds. Uh, wet and dry. Don't think that a wet feed is going to be more or less consistent than a dry feed. Uh, we've often found that these for feeds will, will vary as much as forages and fiber content in particular. So back to uh, one of the points I made a few slides back, focus on consistency. Uh, let's get to a point if, if we, using some of the tools uh, that we spoke on in the, in the team webinar today, figure out what our forage inventories are, when we would expect to perhaps get first crop in, uh, let's just get to a point where we're consistent. Let's not feed more foreign silage now, only to have to reel back later. We don't know what the future holds from a growing environment and standpoint. So let's look at what our inventories are and then cut forage back in diets and, and plan accordingly. Cows will be okay. Your nutritionist can help figure this out uh, or lean on your extension team, perhaps myself. Recognize there are no forage requirements. Right now, soy hulls are a heck of a buy. Uh, so if that was something that you were, uh, if you were looking to cut forage back in your diets uh, and maintain healthy cows, soy hulls are pretty pretty good. Uh, and, and I also had an article um, out with a newsletter back last year, if you wanted to link to that and go check out some comments in there. I'll also put a plug in for a feed valve update. So feed valve is a, a great tool uh, that has existed with formerly Professor Shavers and Lou Armentano and then Victor ha have built out a feed valuation software to take a look at what might be the best buy relative to maybe some more expensive buys. I've gotten involved in the last six months as Randy stepped out uh, with Joao Dorea, and I've collaborated with now uh, Larry Durachek at CP Feeds, Glenn Zupke uh, at First McNest, just to toss their names out there to appreciate their support for providing uh, prices. We're adapting their price information uh, behind the scenes into FeedVal. I ran the model earlier today with some of the updated prices from them. Uh, and you can do this as well or work with your nutritionist to do it. But there are a, a couple of different uh, different assets to FeedVal 7.0 that we've just released, a pretty substantial update. One is we've adapted improved feed library information. Rock River graciously provided all of their analytic information over the last good number of years uh, to help beef up the feed libraries so we have a better understanding of what nutrient supply these offer. We also calculated uh, energy value and nutrient values and supplies in a little bit different fashion. So you'll see a total digestible nutrient uh, parameter now that we can value feeds. This is essentially energy provided, uh, but I chose to look at energy, NDF, and then uh, rumen bypass protein along with uh, the prices that we could currently get these on the market for. And then the tool will report back uh, what, the, what the predicted price is relative to the cohort. So I selected these feeds and then I, I looked for good buys, so to speak. And then I color coded this. So anything in green would be undervalued relative to the, the value it brings into the diet if that makes sense. So green corresponds to better buys. So here we see uh, distillers grains continues to be a decent buy based on TDN and, and protein. Uh, and then um, wet distillers as well. Uh, and then I wanted to point out soy hulls here. So I had said that was a good buy and it looks like I'm contradicting myself. So maybe it's not as good a buy as I was thinking. I'd ran several iterations of this. So my memory is poor. Uh, those of you that know me, I'm far from perfect, so I'll be the first to admit that. Happy to have that on the record via recording. But check out FeedVal uh, and, and use it as you see fit. See if you can identify the best value for your, for your farm. Uh, it, we're also starting to recognize fiber digestibility differences in some of these feeds. So if your nutritionist is heavily working with some of this information, you can also check fiber digestibility on uh, commodity feeds as well. We've found some variants in these as well. Uh, let's see, coming up on just a, a few minutes left and I'll talk about uh, getting maybe outside the, the confines of, of what I was asked to speak about initially, but if you find yourself in troubleshooting situations, I, I will comment that using a TMR sample and doing troubleshooting with a, a total TMR can be valuable. 
to check a few different areas to see if, if we're delivering the nutrition profile that uh, the nutritionist expects, to look at some feed efficiency factors. Uh, UNDF 240 is one that we're starting to recognize, ties to feed efficiency. Uh, I've got some data that I'm not gonna share today, but uh, this is essentially the amount of lignin in the diet, a little bit be better measure of that. And we see ranges in TMR from as low as six to seven units of lignin or just pure crap in the TMR, uh, upwards of 14, 13, 14%. And what we found is the lower the UNDF, regardless of the total NDF, total starch in the diet, the lower the UNDF or the lower the lignification level in the diet, the more efficient cows can be. So this might be something you wanna check if you're not getting the, the performance. We can also look at starch digestibility in TMR samples. And uh, this, this is something we found to positively relate to uh, feed efficiency. Last year's corn crop was a wild one uh, with lighter test weight in some, some situations. Uh, we had a lot of high moisture corn that got, uh, got combined and, and harvested during cold and freezing conditions uh, and is just not feeding like high moisture corn at all. So this might be something to look at to, to figure out how well the grain and the starch in the diet's doing. Uh, if, if we harvested, harvested during freezing conditions, it's probably only gonna be starting to ferment maybe right now as we've had some warmer temps. So it might be a good three to six months behind in the curing process. And then I'm also, and we are also looking at contaminant factors. Uh, so. I'll just wrap up here in, in showing a few slides, the, speaking to contaminant factors. I, I mentioned ash earlier, and when I showed the uh, comparing and contrasting of 2018 versus 2019 corn silage, on paper it looks like feed should be performing from 2019, but I know there are a lot of producers out there, a lot of nutritionists that have been struggling even to the last uh, couple weeks with trying to figure out, all right, why, why aren't we getting the kind of performance out of cows that we would expect based on our traditional uh, nutrition programs and, and uh, experience. Part of that might be due to added ash content coming in from the haylage or even corn silage. I don't have a figure detailing corn silage, but if we look at all of the samples analyzed uh, for haylage crops for the eastern U.S., midwestern U.S., and western U.S., detailed in red lines, green lines would be the Midwest, and then the blue line would be our colleagues out in western U.S., uh, California, uh, New Mexico, Arizona, those areas. What I wanted to point out here was there was a uh, substantial increase in ash content through last growing season. This would be our, our probably second, first, second, third cuts with all the rain and moisture we had, soil splashing up, maybe uh, turning, uh, added tedding, maybe just longer curing out in the field. And so this brings, uh, like I said earlier, dilutes out energy and also could bring in fungal contamination, bacterial contamination. And, and uh, back to this slide, I think there that the immune system may be turning on or maybe some disruption of rumen metabolism might be a factor at play uh, for some farms out there that can't capture the performance uh, that, that they would expect based on their diet formulation. Lance Baumgard, to, to reference his work, has done a great job recognizing that sick cows can, uh, can have a huge energy demand coming from the immune system. Now, these were clinically sick cows. So to, to be clear there, they induced sickness and then measured how much glucose is consumed by the immune system. That was around four and a half pounds of glucose, which may not seem like all that much, but if we convert that into corn grain equivalents, that is seven pounds of corn grain equivalent worth of energy that could be, uh, say, chewed up uh, or used by an activated immune system. So I'm not saying that our, our feeds are making cows sick to this level, but there could be things such as mycotoxin, fungal contamination, bacterial contamination that may be interacting with both the rumen and cow's health. Uh, and so think about look, uh, getting into and looking at feed cleanliness, feed hygiene, if, if we're not capturing the performance uh, as today rolls out. Here is an example and a picture, a credit to my, my colleague Steve Heckles in central Wisconsin, just driving home the point that uh, if we harvest feed during cold weather, I'm not sure how well you can all see this, but this is snow and ice in this fourth cut haylage that was harvested in central Wisconsin. And I'm not certain if this has been fed out or not, but this image comes uh, from a couple months ago. So this had been fermenting. Well, it hasn't fermented at all. It was chopped and and put into a pile and it's decent nutritional value on paper, but it didn't ferment at all, it didn't cure. So uh, some of the nutritional benefits that would be associated with fermentation have not been recognized, were not recognized because this stuff didn't move at all. This feed was sitting in a freezer uh, as it sat there. So with that, I think I'm gonna get to my contact information. Uh, I have a, a few more slides that I'm not gonna get through today. I work closely with Professor Damon Smith uh, he's doing some great work uh, as a UW Extension uh, agent 
in helping us better understand how, what we can do getting into the, the year this this coming growing season to put up healthy crops uh, is it geared it's geared more towards some of the feed hygiene comments i discussed before here's damon's contact information but please download uh, the pdf from the the shared directory and take a look at some of the slides i shared that i didn't get through before uh, i will get to i guess my contact information if you'd like to get out to me directly here's my cell number uh, you, please follow on Twitter uh, if, if you want to share some stories. Uh, I try and put some content out there here and there that I think would relate to uh, improving and moving the dairy industry forward. You can contact me either at, uh, at Rock River or uh, I do a bit of private consulting as well. Or you could reach out to me at, with my university email address, jpgazer at wisp.edu. Any one of those would work. But appreciate the opportunity to come in today. Uh, I guess I could spare a minute or two for maybe a question uh, before I, I duck out for yet another webinar this afternoon. Yep. So, John, the first question for you was, we're having a warm spring and weather is currently sort of dry. Do you anticipate people getting corn and grasses into the ground earlier, assuming they can get the seed? Yeah, gosh, I hope so. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, the forecast the next two to three weeks, as, as I've been watching it, uh, partly out of boredom, has looks pretty decent. So uh, the jet stream may be rather forgiving. So we can get out, uh, I, I hope, and I've not heard of any seed shortages, but yeah, I, I'm anticipating we're going to get out with more of a normal uh, planting season, which will be great. We need it. And John, there's one other question. Again, this might be for you or for others, um, but we'll give you a first uh, take at it. Is um, I have a few growers wanting to possibly switch from a more popular mix in our area to a trip peas mix. What advantages does a trip pea mix have over oats and peas and um, over oats and peas and oats? I believe quicker dry down is one of the main appealing differences. Uh, I'm going to come at it from a different way. So peas are in both, but oats are going to be pretty high yielding. It's going to give us a lot of tons, but it's going to be pretty crappy tons, not, not all that digestible. Whereas trit, if it's harvested uh, boot stage or earlier or uh, flag leaf, that, that can be pretty good forage quality. Uh, I would defer to some of my colleagues that might have some uh, more concrete numbers, but the trit and peas would, would I think give us a little bit better forage quality, whereas the oats and peas would give us more tonnage. 